welcome back to the Black and Raw podcast. I'm your host, Tino Kula Tondarai Von Dabai. I ain't gonna repeat that. Here's a podcast that's creating the dialogue and the space for black men to be their most authentic selves. Now, my guest today is Muzzy Nduna. Muzzy comes onto the podcast to talk about his transition from Zimbabwe here to the UK. He also talks about his journey, um, you know, coming here and adapting um, to a new culture and a new environment. Muzzy also describes how he sort of rejected his father's wisdom, <laughs> I say wisdom, um, but his father's wishes of him going into care. Um, and instead he went for something he's a bit more passionate about. And you'll find out a bit about that later on. He also talks about his property journey and how he transitioned from being um, at, Jaguar, at Jaguar Land Rover to now being in a property business. So I hope you guys really enjoyed this conversation. Please go and like and subscribe, share it with your friends. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a snippet of what you've got to look forward to in this episode. So bear with me for just a second. 100%, I think as we grow up at certain stages, there's a certain version of our parents that we need. Yeah, um, as, as we, as the younger we are, the more we need their presence, physical presence. The older we are, the more we need just their essence. Yeah. So I'm I'm okay with my parents um giving me a phone call to give me advice. You know, I'm okay with my parents sending me money the older I am. But the younger I am, I need the physical presence. So the with the with the parents that left their kids at the younger age, even if you say, I will send everything that you were eating, everything you were wearing, I'm the one who was sending it that's not the parent I needed at the time. Yeah. So I can feel that I, I missed out on a lot here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You did the right thing because if you had stayed, even if I was there present, we would have struggled. However, as I'm a lot, a lot, the younger that I am, the version that I needed of you wasn't there. So you can understand both sides. And it's just an unfortunate situation that um, I guess the circumstances have forced the parents to to split up with their kids to make this better life that we talk about. Local people wouldn't understand, which are, I'm coming from Zimbabwe, I'm coming from a completely different culture. I look different, I sound different. This is uh, an initial challenge that not many people will understand before I actually get on par with anyone else who's, who's already here, right? So me having a weird name, me having a different accent mm -hmm. is my first challenge. Now, if I find more people who have weird names and different accents <laughs> who are already doing it, yeah. that will help with the element of belief that this is actually possible. You're already investing in property and you have a weird name like mine <laughs> and you look different like me. So what's my reason for not doing it not, if yeah. that was my initial challenge? So now that you have seen what you're going to be listening to in this episode. Um, I hope you guys like that little snippet that you got. Um, I really enjoyed my conversation with Muzzy. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it and really get some good value out of it. So before we get started, like I said, please like, subscribe, share. Thank you for watching in advance. And yeah, here is my conversation with Muzzy. Hi, Muzzy. So, welcome to the Black and Raw podcast. It's really good to have you on. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be invited, finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad we finally got this arranged. Yeah, because we met at, um, what was it again? It was, it, oh, ah, it's nice a, it's a Zim UK business chamber um, yeah. in, in Birmingham. Yeah, no, yeah. So, the the, the Black business event. Um, yeah, that was, that was a really good, just to see Laws of Zimbabweans as well everybody in the room together um yeah quite inspiring as well absolutely especially your younger sister <laughs> that was that was um yeah that was actually quite impressive to to have someone at that age doing such amazing stuff not only running her business but also uh doing some charitable stuff um as well um i didn't get to taste her cakes but they looked really good yeah, no, they are really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe maybe I'll I'll try and plug her. I'll try and uh, what do you call it? If you got a birthday or anything coming up, you can oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a shout. I'll give you a shout, definitely. <laughs> so yeah, nah, nah, she yeah, she's she's pretty she's pretty great. Oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah yeah my little sister yeah she does bits to be fair so she, she's quite good with stuff like that impressive indeed at her <laughs> age as well yeah and there was that other young boy toby was it Does oh it... man that Go guy on. um yeah he him and talking about well he's actually quite knowledgeable about geography and knowing anything and everything about anywhere in africa which was actually quite impressive but i was talking about the the railway lines and the the improvement in the transportation system and i how old was he? Like nine or something like yeah, that. Yeah, nine or something like that. Yeah. Oh for, man. man. Yeah. For the listeners that I've obviously no everyone, no one, no one that listens to this is there. But maybe there are some. But yeah, no. That Toby was this his kid that was giving a presentation on the transportation in Leicester, and they were saying how mm. they can make it better. He came up with his own lines. He knew sort of where to where to go and reach rural areas and stuff like that, and like. And in he, he sent a letter to the mayor, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He had a yeah. conversation with the mayor as well and presented oh. that up. And I'm like, talk about bright future. Yeah, no, definitely. So, yeah, I, yeah I'm really looking forward to seeing whatever that kid's future is because he's definitely going places. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I did say on, on the day that I actually went there, I bumped into him before I knew who he was. And um, his mom was struggling to get his tie fixed. So... I did his tie at the start of the day before I actually knew who he was. Yeah. But I actually did say after he did the presentation, I said, when you become a billionaire, remember who did your tie. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, don't forget, don't forget. Don't forget where you come from. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so yeah, so Muzzy, um, so yeah, when I met you, um, you were talking about property and sort of that's the thing you you're into um and that you're doing. Um before we get onto that as well, um, I wanted to know sort of just a bit about um your transition here to the UK. You came here when you were 17. Um, not young, but not young, but not old. Um, mm-hmm. so I came when I was six months old, like nine months old, so I was very young. Um <laughs> so you had quite Sorry. a you wouldn't know nothing about where you're coming from no, at that time. Yeah, no, that time or whatever, no idea. So, yeah, what was it like sort of coming to the UK, transitioning here? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, like you've mentioned, I came here when I was 17. This is back in 2004. And um, like you said, at, at 17, you're, you're fairly young, but then you're not very young, yeah. you know, Um at 17, you've really adjusted to your your surroundings, your environment. I'm used to where I grew up and the people that I surround myself with. And to completely shift um, country, culture, and everything, infrastructure, it was it was um it was a change in a half. And I'll be honest with you, it, it was it was exciting when the idea was brought up say uh, we're going to the UK you know coming mm. from Zimbabwe is like one of the biggest achievements ever um I just had no idea what was lined up for me when I came <laughs> to the UK it was a it was a major change now I've, I've changed schools before in primary school and secondary school and being a new kid is not fun but what I experienced when I got here was completely different mm. it wasn't just being the new kid it's but it was sounding different, looking different to everyone else. And um, it was it was strange, very strange. It, ma- it was made obvious that you're different. You're yeah. not from here. So the transition itself, um, it was like a h- high expectations that were slammed down very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> very quickly. And um, I guess like, like you, you would know now, um, whatever it is that you put into at some point you're just gonna have to adjust mm. you're just gonna have to adjust so I, I i quickly became um because back in zimbabwe the the education system is completely different um uh, we did o levels a levels and here it's gcse so when i got here i automatically became a genius because the o levels are a lot more difficult than gcse here yeah right so when i got here and the questions that were being asked, the syllabuses we're going through, I was thinking, is there a trick question? (laughs) I'm pretty sure I did this in primary, right? And um, just being in that position, and I mean, 
being the one who knows the most, who understands the most in a classroom, it's supposed to be the cool thing. But when you look different, sound different, and you're new, it's yeah, not it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it is not a cool thing. So um I had to just adjust to that envir- environment and um um eventually I kind of did kind of realize that this is it this is what it's going to be uh for a very long time it's not like uh because I don't like this I'm going to have to go back that choice wasn't there yeah. because the whole family had come here so I just had to adjust to that now um eventually when I actually settled in my accent started slowly changing kind of adjusting to what the people saying here what I thought was English back in Zimbabwe is not English (laughs) (laughs) Um, learning the new way of speaking English uh, because I had told myself well the English that we speak in Zimbabwe is the textbook English and if I'm coming to England where English English is supposed to be spoken I'm gonna fit straight in Yeah. yeah turns out the english can't speak english <laughs> so, so yeah it's one of those things that um you, you slowly adjust to you understand that this is completely different and eventually because i was young enough to adjust um i could i could just adjust you know what i mean yeah yeah you're quite more you're more nimble sort of when you're younger yeah isn't it? That yeah you're, like kids have been that kids can adjust quite well to a quite lot a lot quicker. of situations yeah a lot quicker absolutely. than adults absolutely absolutely so yeah which is yeah which is good i'm glad you uh yeah yeah, that's i feel like that's probably quite a lot of people's experience coming over from zimbabwe or just sort of anywhere into the uk is like there's quite a different sort of culture shock um Mm. just the people like especially if you're especially if you are if you look different if you are black um you know if you're european you can sort of you know quite assimilate to it until people hear your voice um but yeah did you i don't know when you when you came here um you're 17 and you're sort of educating um what were you I guess I don't know what I was gonna ask next <laughs> <laughs> um so you would have I guess you would have been doing your GCSEs when you came here and stuff like that and your A-levels uh what did you go and study when you went to uni like how was going to uni here mm-hmm. as well Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I actually came here, I had just finished my O levels. So in in Zimbabwe, it would be Form Four or O levels, and um, I had my qualifications. When I brought them here, they didn't accept them. Yeah, they didn't recognize that that um um that so whatever it is O levels, and here it's GCSEs. It's completely different. So even if I had my certificate for my uh, secondary school, I had to do GCSE again. So I had to oh. go to college for one year just to do my GCSEs so um it was well I kind of like flew through that yeah I I just I just thought I could just take the exam now but I had to go to college for a whole year um so because I got here in in August I kind of fortunately managed to catch the September one um because that's when well that's the other difference in Zimbabwe the the term starts in January yeah. In the UK, they start in September. So it kind of worked out. So I had to just do the GCSEs until the following year. Now, initially, um, again, my dad had been here for years before we came here. Okay. So in terms of what things are like here, we just always went with his suggestions. But the difference is um, the elderly or the older people who came <laughs> from Zimbabwe, the way they view things here, it's slightly different to the way that we would see things so she he he actually made the suggestion that um you know the 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 best career to go for is is anything to do with care yeah um, and if you go into child care that's where you're actually going to make the most amount of money um what he didn't consider is i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> it's not your thing <laughs> it's not my thing so um it's it, it Again, the the majority of people that come from Zimbabwe, it's I'm coming here to work. Yeah, I'm not coming here to enjoy myself. I'm not coming here to get the best career of my, uh, of that I'm passionate about anything of my purpose. I'm here to work to make money with the idea of going back to Zimbabwe at some point, right? Yeah. So this whole that. idea of <laughs> yeah, this whole idea of I I this is what I like to do. Yeah, it was out. So it's childcare. Try that. So I actually tried it. And within a month, I realized this is just not my thing. Yeah. It's like, no, this is not going to happen. So eventually I went to do um, engineering. 
I tried it out. Just let me try engineering. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't like the childcare, besides the fact that the kids were an absolute nightmare, <laughs> it's, um, it's a predominantly female environment. Yeah. So not only did I look different, I was actually uh, the only male and it made me even more isolated. I was so uncomfortable. Um, so I left that, started doing engineering as an apprentice. So I went to, um, um, it's called Midlands Group Training Services in Coventry, where I was an apprentice. Uh, and the good thing about this setup is it's a four-year course where the first two years you're taught anything and everything foundational about engineering, whether mm -hmm. it's welding, um, it, it's, it's, it's electricity, anything, and plumbing, all of it's the foundation. And then as you go along, you get to decide what it is that you want to do, whether you want okay. to be an electrician, a plumber, a welder, um, any sort of engineer that you want to be. And then they, fi they find you a job. Oh, that's really good yeah. then. Yeah. So they actually find you a job where you, the second, the second half of your four years, you're actually working and coming to college at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah. fair enough, yeah. And then um, after that, you can then decide whether you want to go do your HNC or you want to do your degree. So um, I did manufacturing engineering. I seem to quite like the concept of assembling things and writing processes. So I did that and, and they found me a job at a place called Terex where we assembled um, construction vehicles backhoes and dumpers so I did that all the way to uni and I didn't plan this to be fair but it worked out really well because most of the people that went straight to engineering at university and did the three-year course when they went to find a job the struggle was you don't have experience even yeah. though you got qualification whereas when I was doing that I was gaining experience and the qualification at the same time so uh, fortunately, I had the job anyway, so I didn't have to go search for it. But if I were to go search for it, I can use my experience as a worker at that company and I can use my qualifications that I was collating as I was going anyway. Yeah. No, that's so, good. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, you always hear that, don't you? Sort of like, oh, we need you to have two years work experience. But then you're like, no one's going to give go. me work experience. So how am I supposed to get it? There you go. Um, <laughs> it's, it's always a struggle. It's always a struggle. Absolutely. It, it it makes no sense to me anyway. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Like go to uni and then when you finish uni, you got a qualification, uh, you need work experience. Yeah. But how am I going to get it if you don't give me the job? Yeah. yeah. And no, one, so, no one's willing to as well, isn't it? So you sort mm -hmm. of have to. It's, it's mad. It's yeah. mad. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's that's how I transitioned into into the uni and, and, and that's the career path I took. Yeah, nice. I think uh, I think a lot of us can relate in terms of about older parents or sort of telling us, you know, you have to go into care or nursing or doctor or lawyer or, <laughs> you know, something that will be stable and give you money. Um, mm -hmm. But I think with our I think with our generation, even your generation, I think we just have more of a longing to sort of do stuff that we're passionate about actually and Absolutely. sort of like we'll want to make if we want to make money we make money in something that we love to do uh -huh. um but it's but we're in a different position aren't we because for your dad he came here and he was like right I need to provide for my family back home I need yeah. to find something that just gives me money whereas we sort of have a bit more of a we're more settled here and mm -hmm. we're sort of wanting to build um yeah what I guess why do you think like in terms of for your parents, actually, what I wanted to when you're talking about your dad and um, stuff, I think a lot of I think we find that a lot of Zimbabweans, um, a lot of migrants anyway, of dad will come here or mum will come here to work and leave family at home. Um, yeah. What was that like for you guys or having your dad in England and you guys being back in Zim? And to be honest with you, um, for us, as as probably bad as this might sound, it didn't make too much of a difference. Okay. Yeah. Um. Because mum was there. Yeah. So if if mum had gone and dad stayed, might have felt a bit of a difference. Yeah. But it was actually something that we we actually cherished. It's something that we we liked and used quite a lot as a as a showing off kind of thing. Dad <laughs> in the UK, you know. <laughs> so um, it it didn't actually feel like a bad thing at all. Um, yes, of course, there's there's times where we missed him. There's times that we thought it would be fun if he was here and would speak to him uh, on video calls and stuff like that um, and over the phone. But 
majority of the times, because mum was there, uh, we never felt that we were missing a parent. And because a lot of gifts were coming, uh, money was coming from dad, we felt his presence through that. Yeah. Um. So it, it didn't actually feel like um too much of a miss. And I think... I think like looking, I'm thinking about it now. I never actually thought of it this way. Um, Dad's presence, even when he was actually there, he was more of a, um, once he's gone to work, he comes home. He's the, um, he, he's the person who brings us the goodies. Yeah. yeah. It's like, Dad's <laughs> here. Oh, we've got something. So we, we always joked around that if dad goes shopping, we will enjoy what he buys. If mom goes shopping, <laughs> she will buy the essentials that we won't enjoy yeah <laughs> you know she, she'll she'll walk in with the washing up liquids the, the the vegetables before they're cooked and we're just looking at it thinking what the hell <laughs> yeah but that's what we really need but dad will bring crisps and sweets and stuff like that yeah, yeah. and that's the way that he showed love and because that's the way he showed love we felt his, his presence even when he wasn't there because he still sent those gifts yeah yeah so it didn't actually feel too different to be fair and um i think it was about six or seven years he still came back to visit a couple of times it was about six or seven years before we then actually followed and joined him anyway oh so you weren't it wasn't sort of too long of a period yeah it was, um, it wasn't it was gone away for yeah because i know mm-hmm. like my mom works with migrants and stuff like that and i know that she's told me stories before of parents that have came here when their children were young and then they try and bring them over when they're like 17 or stuff mm-hmm. like that. And they're really sort of regretful. Um, like the, the children are really sort of bitter that parents left them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, I guess if you have, if you're a single parent then it's even a bit more damaging because then you sort of left them with a grandparent Absolutely. or something Absolutely. else. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a weird one because I feel like obviously your parent is trying to do the best for you. Mm-hmm. um and to give you money to support you to feed you and stuff like that but then for the kid is also like yeah but I also needed you there as well it's quite a hard yeah. sort of place to be in 100% I think as we grow up at certain stages there's a certain version of our parents that we need yeah um as as we was the younger we are the more we need their presence physical presence the older we are the more we need just their essence yeah so i'm I'm okay with my parents um giving me a phone call to give me advice you know i'm okay with my parents sending me money the older i am but the younger i am i need the physical presence so the with the with the parents that left their kids at the younger age even if you say i will send everything that you were eating everything you were wearing i'm the one who was sending it that's not the parent i needed at the time yeah so i can feel that I missed out on a lot here. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You did the right thing because if you had stayed, even if I was there present, we would have struggled. However, as I'm a lot, a lot, the younger that I am, the version that I needed of you wasn't there. So you can understand both sides. And it's just an unfortunate situation that um, I guess the circumstances have forced the parents to, to split up with their kids to make this better life that we talk about. But it's not an it's not an easy thing for either one. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, it's it's just it's just one of them. But um, I've seen that too. And the fortunate part is, even though there's a bit of a, a period of confusion, a period of resentment, a period of whatever you go through, there's healing in it because at the point that the 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 child grows, they get to see it. And and I think it's really good that you bring the kids here. And once they understand what life is like here, um, because let's be honest, when you're in Zimbabwe, what you think of England is such a glorified um, oh, money falls from trees, <laughs> it's, it's honey and milk. They are chilling, they're enjoying life. And to a certain extent, we are we were at fault at, for it because the stuff that we post on social media and the things that we talk about, um, they kind of portray a certain lifestyle. Yeah. It's up until you come here that you realize, hold on, for that lifestyle to happen, there's a hell of a load of grafting for it. Yeah. There's a there's a load of sacrifice of your social life. You know, socializing in Zimbabwe is a lot more um appreciated and easier. You can just, you know, just walk walk across to get go into someone's house and just knock on the door and walk in. 
here it's very weird for me to just come and knock on your door without announcing myself yeah definitely it's a very strange thing and and once people understand once they get here and actually understand hold on a second this is what life is like this is what you had to go through to give me the things that i had eventually as a child you then actually start understanding there's a lot of sacrifice that my parents had to do to get to to get me to where i am and then that relationship slowly changes that's the fortunate thing eventually that relationship slowly changes into something perhaps even stronger than what it would have been before yeah 100 percent. I, I i like how you put that as well and also just that you have you were saying that you need a parent for a certain like each period of time where you're at in your life you need mm. a sort of different type of parent um how have you found being a parent you told me that um you've got a one-year-old <laughs> and a five-year-old or two-year-old and a five-year-old that was it yeah 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 um so as as i was actually talking about the fact that once you've come here and you see what life is like you start to appreciate more what your parents have done for you and once you become a parent, that level of appreciation gets even better because <laughs> <laughs> you're thinking you had to go through this. I wasn't this bad, surely. <laughs> <laughs> we all think that. We all think that, don't we? We all think that. I was, like, I was the perfect child. I would have never done this to you. But um, yeah, my my parents, my parents. Whenever I tell them about what what the girls are like, because uh, I got two young girls, and they just have a chuckle. <laughs> yeah how does that feel now no, I'm like what do you mean it's like <laughs> this is exactly what you did I'm like there is no way I would have done this and they're like yeah <laughs> but um it's it, it's it's um it's a beautiful feeling um as as parents we may go, go through periods where you're like oh this child has done this this child has done that I'm struggling to sleep I need to work the next day and she or she won't sleep and all that stuff but ultimately it's not an experience I would change for anything it's an absolutely amazing feeling yeah no that's good yeah we all like you're saying yeah we all think of that child I I used to have tantrums when I was a kid um (laughs) wouldn't get like if I wouldn't get ice cream or something like that or something I wanted my mom and dad to say yeah you would just flop yourself on the floor (laughs) in the middle of Asda um (laughs) I once told my aunt who was taking care of me um I said oh well you're just the nanny anyway um, oh. Oh. <laughs> because she wouldn't get me something that I wanted um so yeah kids we can be awful as kids can't we oh, geez <laughs> you can be heartless and 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 what they say is just truthfully how they feel as we grow we know how to filter our feelings to yeah. what we say Oh, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> what they feel at the time is exactly what they say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's and definitely true. And you're thinking, true. what? How could you? Yeah, they have no filter. <laughs> but yeah, they just, yeah, they're honest. They're on, yeah, they're honest to a fault, aren't they, to be honest? But, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, that's no, cute. It's, it's, it's really cute, though. It's, it's really amazing. It's really, <laughs> really amazing. No, definitely. And so um as you're as you're like providing for your family as well and we were we talked a bit about um your engineering um Mm -hmm. and that you were doing that so what happened for you to go from engineering to now working in property yeah um that was a, a strange transition um so my first job my first job in engineering was actually in 2006 two years after um two years after I actually got here and I mentioned that it started as an apprenticeship thing. Mm. And um, my engineering career was uh, probably about, about 13 years. Oh, wow. So you did it for quite a yeah. while. So I did it for quite a while. Um, in the West Midlands, the, the biggest manufacturing industry that's there is cars. So assembling cars. Uh, and it, it was always sort of a dream of mine to work for Jaguar Land Rover because they're mm. the big one. So either working for Jaguar Land Rover or working for their suppliers. Yeah, right? it's a flex. It's a flex. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's an absolute flex. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like it's that pinnacle where you just, you know, in anything that you want to do and just kind of hint it to anyone that you're having a conversation it's like oh yeah i work for jagger land don't need to say anything else you know don't need to say anything else i work for jlr and leave it there um so it was always a thing that i wanted to do um 
and slowly kind of moving through my stages uh when i started as an apprentice apprentice is like as low as it gets when you yeah. actually start working it's as low as it gets you're the kid that goes in and, and gets tea for everyone <laughs> you know goes to buy the sandwiches and i slowly moved up to an operator to a team leader became a supervisor um and then became a manager as i moved along different companies um and then eventually i made it to jlr flex eventually <laughs> made it to jlr and I'm there like um so when I went to jail I initially I was um uh, what's called a planning supervisor um and then became a business improvement manager that's the last title that I had when I was a, a Jaguar Land Rover so as you can imagine with uh, with a lot of people that wish to be engineers or a lot of people that are looking to to do any engineering career being a business improvement manager for Jaguar Land Rover it's up it's, there it's up there yeah, yeah it's up there and my parents are like another level of proud. Mm-hmm. You know, you were talking about how parents want you to do some something like engineering, doctors and all that. Um, I think it's less about the money, less about the security. It's more about bragging rights for them. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. 100%. <laughs> so they actually, they actually take that as part of their identity. My son is a... Yeah. yeah. And it's like a, a conversation started to anyone that they even even someone that had a, they had a grudge with back in school. <laughs> wow, well, how's things? Oh, my son's an engineer. I didn't type, ask, but you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um so i in in back in 2018, so at this point I'm a I'm a business improvement manager. 20, 2018, um my it was actually my wife's friend who suggested um a property training course. So from my point of view at the time, property is something that is um, you you kind of go through school, you go through college, go to uni, get a job, meet your partner, um, buy a house after you get married, and then you have kids and you live happily ever after. And then at some point later on in life, if you've really made it, you might be able to raise enough money to buy a second home that you can yeah. rent out. Yeah. So that was like an unwritten blueprint that I was following. So at the time that someone said property training course, and I was thinking, what do you mean property training for what? It's like how to invest in property. I was like, well, when it comes to property, you just need to raise a deposit and buy the house with the mortgage. What else is there to it? Right. Um, this really sounds like a scam, <laughs> right? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a proper scam. So this training course was in Manchester, about two hours drive from where we live. And um, my wife really wanted to go to it. So my wife and my sister-in-law wanted to go for it. And they don't like driving. I love driving. Yeah. So they, they tagged me. So I you. Could do the <laughs> and I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to drive them there. We'll go to this course just to, you know, um, get them to do whatever it is that they want and make a, a weekend of it. So I went there really skeptic, just thinking, right, let's just get through, get through this. They're going to find out what I already know. And I'm just going to be like, I told you so. Yeah. Let's go back home and continue with life. <laughs> but <laughs> what I found out when I got there was, was absolutely eye-opening. And this was, it was a two-day course. And on my first day, I was like, Wow. Now, you know, when you actually go there thinking, I'm about to be scammed, mm. you're, you're reserved. You're thinking, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. Now, for them to actually turn my thought process at the time to get me thinking, geez, this is a thing. This can actually work. That was something. So I actually walked out of that course more passionate about getting into property than the people that took me <laughs> Um, that was the that was the turn of events that's the bit where I actually thought um, I was so motivated and I believed in this thing that I was like you know what this is it this is what I want to do I'm going to leave my job at some point and that's when people started getting a little bit freaked out yeah as well so that's a big leap being Jaguar uh, yeah. Land Rover yeah. and then you're like, like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Mm. Um, it is is <laughs> my wife was there like yeah, yeah, yeah let's do property but chill out on the job, yeah. <laughs> calm yourself down. And um, I think um, it, it was a case of, I wanted to try this for about a year and um, I'd convinced myself that I was going to leave my job by the end of uh, 2019 at the time. Mm. And um, I started, I really went for it. I started doing a lot of networking events, got a lot more knowledge, 
connected myself with loads of people that were doing property and I knew people that were doing property and I just thought you know they had um, inheritance and some people had won lottery because there's no way you can just buy houses it's not an easy thing mm. you know um, you can't save up for a house over 10 years easily enough in my head I was thinking it's a very long period it's not going to be a, a, an easy thing to do um, so there's a couple of Zimbabwean guys who I knew at the time who I knew were doing property and I was convinced because they were older it, it they are at that stage that I talk about where in, you know in my 50s or 60s yeah, I'm going to have enough money to start doing it and that's where I thought they were at. So I never asked them about how they did it because in my head, I'd already concluded that that's how they did it. You know, they worked really hard, saved up a lot of money. Now, I, I reached out to them to say, I've learned about this. I'm looking to get started in this. Is there any way that you can help? Um, unfortunately, they weren't willing to help, <laughs> which was quite heartbreaking for me because these are people that I'd known for a few years. We played football together you know, we 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 go to um night out, you know, the 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 local Zimbabwean places that you meet up at on a Saturday night, where you see the same faces every single time, play the same music, and it feels like you've gone back home. So we got to know each other and you see them as um your your parents type thing, you respect them like that. So when they actually turned me down on this request, which I thought they were going to be proud of me. That's the other thing. What really disappointed me is because I had high expectations. I'm going to show up and say, I want to invest in property. I've learned about all of these. I was expecting them to think, fantastic. Someone who is thinking entrepreneurially, you know, yeah. um, someone who's trying to move into the business sector and move away from employment. I thought they were going to be really proud of it. So I was quite heartbroken by that. And whenever I tell the story, especially with other Zimbabweans, it's like, oh yeah, Zimbabweans, that's what they're like. And um, as I'm, I think I mentioned it to you at some point, this is a narrative that I hear quite a lot. And even though I was quite heartbroken about it, I would not accept that it's because there's Zimbabwe. Because I thought to myself, if I accept that it's because there's Zimbabwe, that means I'm like that too, since mm -hmm. I'm Zimbabwe. Yeah. So I refused to believe that. And then that's where the incentive actually started on actually reaching out to other Zimbabweans who have my mindset who are thinking different. So I can actually um, disrupt this mentality of Zimbabweans are not willing to share. Yeah. And fortunately, I've managed to find quite a lot of them that are like that. <laughs> this is, That's this is um, That's yeah, th this is this is where the, 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 the property journey actually started. It was through that training event. And um, eventually, I didn't leave my job in 2019 as I planned. I eventually left my job um, in in 2020. Okay, right just yeah. before COVID. Are you sure you didn't want to stay? <laughs> so to, to be honest with that, they actually helped me out. So during the COVID period, there was that whole furlough thing. Um, it's like um, a furlough is a word that existed for hundreds of years, but no one knew it until COVID. Yeah, until COVID, yeah. <laughs> so um, they put they put us on furlough. Um, this whole concept of firstly we need you to to continue working, but you're gonna work from home, and my job didn't really have anything to do at home it was just a a, a tick tick box exercise that yeah uh, he's still working but i had still... nothing to do <laughs> i had absolutely nothing to do so what i did was um i, I started building my property portfolio yeah. during work time during work time and, and getting paid for and, it uh, that's 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 a good setup. Get, that's a very and, good setup. and getting paid for it now i got into trouble for it so uh <laughs> so it was um I was I was brought in for disciplinary because I was um apparently I had a second job. Oh right? okay. And and being a director of a business whilst I'm employed apparently was classed as a second job. Oh. Right. And um I argued the case so many times, but then I realized later on what was going on. So it was a pointless fight. And then I realized that I'm just about to be pushed. Yeah. So I thought I'd jump before I get pushed. Unfortunately, at the time, um, they they issued out um voluntary redundancies for anyone who wants to actually leave. And I thought I was ready to leave for free. Now you're offering to pay me to leave. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll take I'll that. Take Thank it. you very much. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank you very much. So um, I walked out with a with a nice package that I used to 
um to enhance my property portfolio as well yeah no that's brilliant um and I, it, it worked out for you as well because you sort of like even though you know like sometimes when you're starting a new thing in a new business you sort of got to take a leap and be like right yeah. I'm not gonna get rid of all this stuff done before get rid of all this money that I've got before but it worked out quite nicely for you that it was COVID, COVID happened then you got furloughed and mm -hmm. then they're like actually nah you know you've got two jobs you need to go and then they're like yeah we'll pay you to go and you're like ah. We'll take that. We'll take that. We'll take that. You you give me more money to go into my property. So exactly, it, it works all the best. Um, <laughs> exactly. So how have you found being in the property market, especially during this sort of time where you've got high inflation? You know, prices mm. are soaring as well. Um, I think for a lot of people that look at wanting to buy a house or even buy their first house, it can be quite daunting, can't it? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um. So. That's a great question, by the way. And and firstly, for any of the listeners who might be thinking now, yeah, um, how do we actually get into property when all of this is going on? There is never going to be an ideal place. There is not going to be an ideal time. Every single time, even the history is that you're actually thinking, if we had bought houses at that time, the people at that time had something that mm. they were worried about right um it, it might be inflation now it might be the fact that house prices are dropping it might be um the the changes in politics the economy it could be anything there's always a reason that makes think people think oh this might not be the time right so we have a saying in property that says um that's um that that says yesterday was the best time to get started today is the next best time yeah, there's not going to be an ideal time that you think, you know what, let's wait until this happens and then we're going to let's wait until this happens and then we're going to you'll be you'll be waiting for that time for years and years. Yeah. Right? So um, I would say, yes, all of that is going on. Um, I mean, the, the mortgage mortgage interest rates have just gone absolutely ridiculous in the past few months. Um, the house prices just about four or five months ago were soaring. Now they're dipping. Yeah. Um there's the 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 beauty of it is when it comes to investing in property there's so many different strategies of investing. There's there's the rental side, there's the purchasing side. There's the purchase to sell and there's the purchase to keep. There's so many different things you can do with the property once you've actually purchased it. And because there's so many things, there's different strategies that work for certain times. Yeah. So you can continue investing in property in whatever environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the term investing in property or property investor is an umbrella. It's a blanket of so many different things. So even though you are actually right that all of these things are going on, you can still invest. But you just need to you just need to utilize the this a specific strategy that works for that time and that works for that location as well so there's a lot to consider in it yeah no so, definitely yeah there is a lot i i know um there's these guys uh, there's a podcast i don't know if you listen to the property podcast um and they have a business they have a business they even have an app now called the property hub where like they're trying to make it easier for a lot of other people to invest into property as well um so i think like you said there there are many ways many strategies and many things you can sort of do to get into property if you want to i, I think mm -hmm. it's just sort of about doing your research networking and sort of finding out um i mean if you're zimbabwe and, and you're in and you like property as well they can always come to you too um you've Absolutely. got what you got whatsapp chat as well that's always popping off every time i see it on my phone. <laughs> um how come you made that whatsapp group was it was it just to sort of share information was that just an easy place to get everybody in as well yeah um so it, it really strongly ties to the story that i mentioned earlier on um where i tried to get assistance from fellow zimbabweans and then i got turned down and um, looking back at the way things happened, me being turned down by those uh, two guys uh, who are still in my circles, by the way, still actually yeah. work with them. I, I respect <laughs> them. Um, they're gonna me hear being turned now. down, they're going to hear it, but they won't know who they are. <laughs> 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 me being turned down by them was actually a blessing in disguise. This group that you're talking about is, is the Zim Property Investors Group. It would have never been created if they hadn't turned me down. 
there's always a reason for something happening. That heartbreak that I felt was actually the birth of this group because what I was looking for at that point is to firstly, um, firstly actually prove my thought process that it's not because they're Zimbabwean because there's loads of Zimbabweans that are open to sharing information. There's loads of Zimbabweans that are open to collaborating. Yeah. And I'm going to find them so I can prove myself right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was on a mission to find them. And boy, did I find them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I started going crazy in social media and um, my initial post. So if you actually go on my profiles, if you go as far as I, I, I um, when I started in property, I rarely ever mentioned the fact that I was in Mm. I rarely mentioned it up until this happened. Right. And the reason why I started talking more about me being Zimbabwean is because I was trying to attract other Zimbabweans that are going to reach out to me and say, oh, you're Zimbabwean. Yeah. yeah. So my name is Muzing Ayanguna, but because I shortened it to Muzi, not many people would actually put, put me anywhere. All right. They wouldn't actually know where is he actually from. And the accent is completely different. So you can't pick up that he's from Zimbabwe. No, you at can't. Any point. Yeah. <laughs> so it's when I started saying that I'm a Zimbabwean and actually introducing myself as a Zimbabwean, even in the in the big property networks that I go to, Zimbabwe started coming to me. And the more I spoke to them, the more I realized that there's more of us who are willing to share this information. And then I thought, okay, fair enough. So if there is more of us who are willing to share this information, maybe me going through the 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 the, the pain that I went through is a sign that I'm the one who's supposed to start this. Yeah. So in April 2020, I started the group. It started on Facebook initially. And yeah. we called it the Zim Property Investors. So initially it was just to attract as many Zimbabweans as possible who are in property, who are interested in property. Yeah. So the more people that are in property who are already doing it, um, who come in and we start sharing information and we did interviews like this one and just had conversations about certain strategies, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and also the, um, the challenges that local people wouldn't understand, which are, I'm coming from Zimbabwe. I'm coming from a completely different culture. I look different. I sound different. This is... Uh, an initial challenge that not many people will understand before I actually get on par with anyone else who's, who's already here, right? So me having a weird name, me having a different accent mm -hmm. is my first challenge. Now, if I find more people who have weird names and different accents <laughs> who are already doing it, yeah. that will help with the element of belief that this is actually possible. You're already investing in property and you have a weird name like mine <laughs> and you look different like me. So what's my reason for not doing it not, if yeah, that was yeah. my initial challenge, right? So the more we actually had of these Zimbabweans who are doing that, and then we actually started attracting other people from different nations. So it's the Zim Property Investors because it was started by Zimbabweans, but it's not exclusive to just Zimbabweans, by the way. Anyone yeah. can come and join. Me, <laughs> right? Anyone can come in. So fortunately, that group has grown now on Facebook. It's got currently 1,800 people in there. Wow, and good... it's got people from all over the world now who are just sharing information. And the WhatsApp group initially was created for the Zimbabweans in the UK, where we can discuss specific things about investing in the UK. But it's got loads of people from different countries <laughs> as well. And um, as you've said, that group is always popping, questions being asked, uh, questions being answered, and people are very collaborative. Now, when someone says, well, Zimbabweans are not willing to share, I can say, actually, you're wrong. You're wrong. I've got evidence. Yeah. Yeah. I've got evidence. <laughs> Look at all of this information that Zimbabweans are willing to share. No one in that group is being paid for that information, right? And we've actually realized the more information you share, the more you attract, and you inherently actually start doing better because people are willing to, you, you, you become a magnet to people and opportunities come even more than you could ever, you could ever think of. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, and I like how you chain, I like how you turn sort of that rejection and that, um, and I wouldn't even say failure, but just sort of that rejection mm -hmm. into sort of something that now, you know, you're changing the narrative about Zimbabwe and sort of that we can, we do like to share, we do like to collaborate and stuff like that. I I think you find, like, I feel like there's quite, there's quite a lot of that sort of stereotype amongst sort of ethnic minorities um, yeah. that, you know, no one wants to 
uplift each other or you know promote someone else's work rather than promote and rather promote their own and stuff like that so mm-hmm. I'm glad that um you've been able to do that and it was it's a good sort of you can see sort of your mindset in that sort of actually no I'm not going to accept that fact and, and it's not even the fact I'm not going to accept that perception yeah and I'm going to sort of change it so yeah that's really brilliant appreciate it appreciate it now it's actually worked out really well and um obviously i might be just the spark who got it started but then it would never work if it wasn't for the people that actually join in and and and, and collaborate anyway there's times where i don't even say anything at yeah. all, and the information is just flowing okay. just flowing so it's beautiful to see him to be honest with you sometimes i just i just sit back and just watch it happen in the background and I feel a sense of pride that we actually did start this and, and it's actually happening the way that it is. So um, no, it's fantastic. It's really fantastic. It's an absolute blessing. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So did you, um, you said that you and your wife, are you both doing the property together? Are you both in it together? So initially my wife was fully in it. Um, and then she quickly realized that she doesn't like property. <laughs> so she went, <laughs> took you there. And then she like, took nah. me there and um, we started it together. And then she quickly realized it's not really her thing. So uh, my wife is obviously the, the business is ours. Anything that we do is ours as, as, as husband and wife. Um, but ultimately she's not necessarily in the property business. She, she understands it. She knows what it is that's going on. She helps out here and there. But um, she prefers to just be on the outside. So she is doing her own thing. Um, as you already know, she's a marriage coach. She's running yeah. her own business, doing helping people in a certain way that she feels passionate, uh, passionate about. So, um, it works out. I help out with that as well. Um, I I I go as part of her conversations, the interviews that she does as the husband. Um, <laughs> but she's she's not in the property thing. No, fair enough. No, that's mm-hmm. all right. Um, I, I, to be fair, I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously I'm not, I'm not married yet or anything like that. But I feel like it's always sort of good. Um, when in a relationship, you both have your own things, but you can also sort of support each other on your different things as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm a big believer in that. And whether it's it's marriage or just a relationship, um, I, I, I am all for have your own thing and support each other on your own thing because if one of you doesn't have their own thing um it 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 creates a bit of resentment to a certain extent at some point it will hit you that um hold on a second what is my thing Mm -hmm. i don't want to be just the person who supports that person right what is my thing and i think it works out far much better when you have your strength as an individual your strength as an individual and your strengths you use them to actually build each other on what you are already doing yeah so i'm part of her business she's part of mine but she's got her thing i've got my thing yeah definitely um Mm -hmm. and so i guess for you um what is like what are your sort of some of your aspirations or sort of future plans for being Mm -hmm. in property um and yeah working in it as well yeah, um, to be honest with you, at the point that I started this property thing, it was um, once I've actually understood what, what it entails, it's like, let's just grow this portfolio as big as it absolutely can be. Mm. Right? Let's just build this as much as possible, create this whole concept of uh, financial freedom, generational wealth and all this. And, and it was great. It was fantastic. Um, however, now... Um, I realized that in in everything that I actually start and do do well at, I enjoy showing someone else. I enjoy teaching someone else and uh, breaking barriers, so to speak. Whenever someone has a different, a certain mindset, and I feel that it's a bit of a flawed one, and it's a it's a self sabotage kind of mindset. I will use my experience and the things I already know to try to help them to see it completely differently. So they're a bit more positive. I did that not knowing, uh, but I did that even in when I was in engineering, I started actually teaching people the things that I knew. And um, I think to a certain extent, that's probably how I was actually um, given the role as a supervisor or team leader 
because I was more of a, a motivator and, and had a, a way of explaining things, uh, understanding from their point of view and then pointing it out so they understand it a lot better. Um, being an operator helped me be a good team leader because I can see it from that point of view. Being a Zimbabwean helps me show other Zimbabweans how to invest in property in a certain way that not many people can show. And I feel that in all those experiences, I've been given certain tools and it becomes my responsibility to a certain extent to then uh, shed a light on a darkness that not many people even realized existed. So in the property business, I'm just going to let this grow. My aspiration now is for the business to completely run itself completely without me being required whatsoever. Mm. Yeah, it's there, it's running. Um, so that uh, so I'm working on working on the business rather than in the business, and that will happen anyway. And my passion is being able to help people with whatever I have. And right now, it's the experience, it's, it's the knowledge that I've accumulated so far. And bear in mind, even though I've got some stuff that I can teach and show other people, I'm still a student, I'm still learning quite a lot. I'm pretty young when it comes to this. Out of all of the things that I've done, I'm the youngest at this because I've only been doing it for four years. Yeah. Yeah. It's strange that I'm I'm kind of seen and known as the property guy, but property is what I've been doing for the least amount of years. <laughs> yeah. You're more the engineering guy more than Yeah, anything. I'm more yeah. of an engineering guy. I've been playing football for a lot more years. <laughs> I've been I was in, in, in education for a lot more years, but I'm known as a property guy and yet I've only been doing it for four years. But it's it's one of those. And with all that information and the experience that I've gone through, I really enjoy sitting down with either a group of people or certain individuals and go through the information after understanding where they are at. Yeah. I hear what people are saying. I hear where they are at in terms of um, either getting started in property or even when I'm actually helping other couples with my wife and listening to their challenges as a guy, challenges as a, as a, as a woman. And with our experience being married for, over eight years now and being in a relationship for over 15 oh, wow. um i i hear it and i'm like i get that i really get that you know and being able to actually relate to a certain um say call it problem or a situation and being on the other side i think to a certain extent and this is not just for me it's for anyone and everyone who's had an experience in certain things it becomes to a certain extent our responsibility to shed a light and help those people through that challenge. Um, I, I recently heard someone talking about a human being's purpose. And there's different um, things that people have said before. It's like our purpose is to leave this world in a better place than we found it. And um, one of the things that actually feeds us the most is being able to help another person in whatever way you can think of. And that's one of the most uh, refreshing feelings. And if you've ever been in a situation where someone is in need of help and you've offered that assistance and you see that your assistance has actually made a difference in how they feel, it's it's such a great feeling. And I want that feeling a lot more now. Yeah, no, it is a great feeling. Like we had, um, we have these conversations um in in my on my dinner table with my with the family um my mom was asking do people sort of do anything wholeheartedly um and I was like well I I don't think so I mean I think we're all sort of we're just selfish human beings just in general mm -hmm. but I think that like as you're saying like if you're helping somebody like it, of course it's going to bring you joy like and I don't think mm -hmm. there's anything necessarily wrong with that um because like because you're not necessarily helping them because you're like oh i want to be ego boosted but it is going to make you feel good because it's nice to see it someone is. smile it's nice to see that you've helped somebody um mm -hmm. so yeah i agree with you i think that's mm -hmm. all of our purpose is to leave this place much better than we left it um 100 and it's like a like i always hear if i was listening to podcasts some people will ask oh what is your what is your legacy or like do you care about legacy and stuff like that um and I always sort of think oh how would I answer that question and I, I think sort of in terms of what you were talking about in terms of that if you're able to 
leave a mark on people and make an imprint and you don't even know how you're going to do it to be honest with you like you could they could literally just be buying someone a cup of coffee in the morning and you know mm-hmm. something maybe they really needed that um or it could be something much bigger but like leaving the imprint on people i think is probably the best legacy that you can have really absolutely absolutely and um um Warren Buffett is one of the, the the greatest investor investors in the mm. world. He recently said that, um, and he was talking about sales in and he was talking to students who are actually doing sales and marketing, and um, he was talking about how you make people feel, and he said something which I found quite profound. Um, that people will forget what you said to them, people will forget what you did to them, but people will not forget how you made them feel. And I think that's a really powerful thing, and how you make someone feel and going back to the statement that you're making, uh, the, what you're talking about uh, being uh, selfish. There's a guy called Dr. Wayne Dyer. If you've never read any of his books, I would recommend you read his book. Dr. He's Wayne amazing. Dyer. Okay. Dr. Wayne Dyer. And um, he was talking about a scenario where um, if you imagine someone who's begging on the street, and then someone goes in and gives that person something and helps them, whether it's with food, it's money, it's money or whatever. The beauty of that activity is it makes the person who is begging feel better. It makes the person who's just given them feel better. But it also makes the people who are watching it feel better. Mm. Yeah. So he actually said a statement, which I find quite strange, but true, that helping someone is one of the most selfish things you can do because it makes you feel better. Yeah. No, that's so true. it actually made me see the concept of the selfishness as not a bad thing. It's great to feel that way. And even if I'm doing it to feel that way, I am actually inevitably making loads of people feel the way that I feel. So what's wrong with that? Yeah, I've never looked at it like that before. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, now, now I want to go and look at his books. To be fair, I want to see what this. Oh guy yeah, hundred percent. Any 100%. recommendations? Any which ones you recommend? Um, so he he wrote a book called. Um, this was one of his last books before he actually passed away. Um, oh, I can't remember the name. Of it. <laughs> Always when you just can't. It. it will it will come back to me. It will come back to me <laughs> after um, we get off this call. You remember it <laughs> exactly. Like, ah. <laughs> but if he just type in Dr. Wayne Dyer, Dr. he's got Dyer, talks okay. on um on YouTube as well about different things. But um, there's the one book that I would recommend, and if it comes back to me at some point in the middle of this conversation, <laughs> I'll just throw it in. <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, I don't think we're gonna get time because I was just gonna ask you one final question, mm-hmm. which I ask all my guests. Um, yeah. and I've loved having this conversation with you, Muzi. I'm, I'm glad we finally got to do it as well. Um, so say if there's a young black boy um that's listening to this conversation how can something that you know or something that we talked about today help them with an understanding of themselves wow what a question (laughs) what a question i guess it's relevant for me too being a black guy um (laughs) tell you what this is an um it might be a completely different way of seeing things and and i'm only going to be speaking of my own experience I did, uh, as I've mentioned, when I came to the UK, I did realize, I did notice that I actually looked different. And that was about me being black. The weird thing about me being black, um, and for anyone who's not watching this and can hear me, I'm a light-skinned black person. Yeah. So when I was in Zimbabwe, I was actually teased about being a white person. Ah. Uh. Yeah. So it was actually strange. I'm not half, uh, I'm not I'm not mixed race or anything. Both my parents are actually black. I'm just a light-skinned guy. And it was weird because, um, well, eventually I kind of got used to the fact that I'm just a light-skinned guy, you know. And then coming here, I realized that I'm actually the darkest one of the crew. It was a strange <laughs> feeling, strange feeling. However, the concept of, um, and I, I, I sort of like, I wouldn't say blame. I actually put this on on my parents they protected us quite a lot this whole idea of um racism was not a big thing to us we were protected from it we didn't actually know it that much it was things in the books 
uh, racism to us is how um, the white people treated the black people back in the colonization days. Yeah, it's not something that we saw at any point. So coming here, what we class now as as racism, like uh, certain words that are said, certain um, statements, I didn't understand them. So even though I heard them at the time, they didn't do anything to me because I didn't get what they were. Mm. Yeah, and it was funny because um Trevor Noah actually spoke about this as a comedian. That's the certain things that are said now that you understand that's a racist thing to say. But when he heard them the first time, because the version of racism in South Africa is different to in America, yeah, certain things different. that they would say to him at the time, and they don't have that feeling. You don't actually feel hurt because that doesn't mean anything to you, right? So it's it's strange that um. I went through that period and certain things that I recall now when I when I recall them and think, oh, they actually did say this to me, but I never felt it because it didn't mean anything to me. However, I never actually felt um, my blackness, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, it's not something that I actually ever thought, do you know what? I feel different because I'm black. I felt different because I was different. I didn't actually attach it to my skin color. Yeah, I initially attached it to my um to my accent because I knew I sounded different to everyone else. Um, at some point I I attached it to my intellect because I was the geek, and and you know the geeks are actually just <laughs> you know abused in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. so you try to hide away your intellect, and and every time I heard certain questions and people struggling with certain things in maths, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I had to I had to you know I had to pretend I don't get it too. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can't even answer the question. I want to leave it alone and just write my answers in silence. And the teachers would actually point it out that if you're struggling with maths in any way, just look at Mrs. Coursework. I'm like, no, don't, do that. <laughs> don't, you know. So that's I felt different for that reason. And um, me being black, um, I never actually felt it as a thing in the UK. I associated myself with a lot of black individuals. I associated myself with the uh, um, predominantly Zimbabweans. And I did hear about their experiences. And I always felt like I lived in a completely different world mm. because the things that they talked about and saying that um, these people are so racist, these people are doing this, even in the workplace, they look down on us. And I'm thinking, am I living in a completely different world here? And to a certain extent, I actually think if you actually go with that mentality, you're always going to find what it is that you're looking for. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there are no racist people. There's no racism at any point. Um, I'm saying if you actually look for it, if you believe that the people in this country, anyone who's white in this country is inherently racist, you're going to find it even in things that they're not necessarily doing. Yeah. And in terms of, if I'm looking at myself, um, so speaking, going back to your question, speaking to uh, a young black guy in this environment who is considering starting in property, I guess, or starting a business, um, what worked for me, even though I wasn't consciously doing it, what worked for me is not looking at myself as different because of my skin color. I feel that, um, and again, I'm speaking from my experience, I feel that if I see myself different because of my skin color, and then take that narrative of people in this country look down on people who have my skin color, I will inherently go in at a disadvantage. Because I'm already kind of looking for it. You know, someone could look at you different and straight away like, oh, there you go, he's racist. Yeah, someone could say something um, which had nothing to do with your skin color. And if you actually attach it to that, you're already at a disadvantage uh, because you've put yourself there. So me not looking at myself that way, I put myself on par straight away. Um, I, I have this natural positive feeling where I'm trusting uh, of the people that I meet. Um, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt, so to speak. I, I assume everyone has the best of intentions for themselves and for the person that they're talking to being me. Yeah. Until they prove me wrong. And I think going in with that mentality, you're more likely to be successful than the other way around. 
yeah. from my yeah. point of view. No, brilliant, brilliant. I, I don't. I'm, I, I think I'm gonna let the audience sort of simmer on that, and uh, yeah, because I think that's really good. To be honest with you, I think just about your mindset and how you approach things can it can change your perception. It can change sort of your reality to a certain extent. So yeah, no, thank you very much, Muzzy, um, for coming on to the Black and Gold podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a really good. I had a really good time with you as well. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's all right. Hopefully, we can do this again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. I shall speak to you soon. All right, cool. So that is the end of the episode, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that episode. I really enjoyed talking to Muzzy. I think a lot of the things that he was saying, I think, are really relatable for anyone that's coming here to the UK, especially if you're an ethnic minority and, you know, you look a bit different, you sound a bit different. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we can all take a lot from what Muzzy has said and um, I really hope you guys uh, enjoyed this episode. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight what Muzzy was saying in terms about him being able to um, pivot and um, do engineering instead of being in the care business. Um, and I think for a lot of us uh, second generation migrants that came here, like me, um, my parents were first, first generation migrants. Um, for them, they had to come here to survive um, and I think that just allowed us to thrive and to choose our path and what, what we want to do. So I just wanted to say that, you know, don't necessarily just do what your parents are telling you, but also thank them for them coming here and creating a new life for themselves, but also for you too. So um, that's just a little tidbit. <laughs> Thought I'd love end the episode of that. <laughs> but yeah thank you very much for watching guys um there will be a new video out next week uh go and check that out i'm not going to tell you what it is just yet um but i want to release it on friday actually so yeah go and check that out um and yeah i don't think i have anything else more to say guys um thank you for listening thank you for watching um if you want to get into contact with me you can email me at speak at black and UK or just check out my socials at Black and Brawl, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, and check out my website, www.blackandbrawl.co.uk. So, I don't think I have anything else. I keep saying I don't have anything else, then I keep adding on that I've got something else. <laughs> so, this is me speaking off, seeing off, whatever. Um, this is me having a little send off to you guys. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk soon.